Welcome everybody to our latest episode of Alumni Talk brought to you by the Alumni Basketball League owned by Kareem Rush and Jake Jackson. We just announced our first game of the season, which will be between the alumni of Kansas and Kansas State on June 10th in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, ticket sales will be available soon. Link for tickets will be available soon. Um, follow us ablballing.com website at ablballing on Instagram at the ablusa on Twitter. And you find this podcast on YouTube and also Apple Podcasts. Today we have Mr. Frank Ross, a uh, legend in my hometown, D.C., NBA per, uh, personnel, been the VP for the Wizards for a long time. Mr. Ross, how you doing, sir? I'm good, Ricky, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you coming on, man. So just to get started, uh, let's talk about your basketball career, man, just coming up in the D.C. area. and um, what, what got, Who got you involved in basketball and what, what did your start look like? Um, first of all, I want to I want to give a little bit of give you some flowers for the stuff that you're doing in the area. So oh, man. Uh, I first want to start off by doing that. And then, um, you know, going to my, my basketball career actually started um, the very first time I played organized basketball with Silver Hill um, with Silver Hill Boys Club. My very first basketball coach was uh, Quincy Jones with uh, Silver Hill Boys Club. And up until that point, I thought I was going to be a football player because we had um had moved from Southeast DC and uh, we had, I had played, um, I had been playing with the Woodland Raiders uh, for the, uh, the late great Calvin Woodland, who was actually also a, um, had, um, was a, a boxer uh, and had boxers in the area as well. So Silver Hill was my first introduction to um, organized basketball. And so, um, you know, I was like most kids that, um, picked up a ball. I uh, I wanted, you know, I, I fell in love with the game and I wanted to be good. And I decided, um, uh, ironically, um, I was playing football. Uh, I was in ninth grade for Silver Hill and we had a game at Alt Village. And um, I can't remember who, uh, we had a quarterback that couldn't throw at the time. So I was <laughs> playing like tight end or whatever. So I was just like, hey man, I, I ain't put myself in harm's way. Just put me on the line, let me block. And so um, I, I went uh, after we played the game at Camp Springs, I told Mr. Jones, who actually was had, was my first basketball coach. He was the, the uh, one of the football coaches. I think Mr. O'Neill, the late uh, Gene O'Neill, who was a pioneer with Silver Hill Boys Club, um, was also was the head coach. And so Mr. O, uh, I told Mr. Jones I was going to get a hot dog. And so and I go to get a hot dog and I turn around and everybody was gone. And so I had to walk home from off village back over to Hillcrest Heights. And, and, you know, I guess that was like my, <laughs> my, during my walk about home, I decided then I was just going to stick with basketball. So I was in ninth grade and I had decided I was going to play, just play basketball. So, um, and then I, you know, I played 12, 13, 14 year old basketball with Silver Hill. And then it was, I, you know, went on to Potomac uh, to play JV and played, ended up playing JV for two years at Potomac, basically, and then played my senior year uh, on varsity. And I had like I had I was crazy enough. to I had a lot of self-belief, I'd say, um, in my in, in myself. Um, and I had three goals to, you know, um, I going into my senior year of high school for a guy that played JV that I had, I uh, wanted to get a division one scholarship playing the McDonald's capital classic and um, get a three point grade point average. So before we get uh, into that, you played for my guy, Ducky Vaughn, didn't you? Yeah, I played duck, duck coached um, with, uh, with Mr. Bates, um, AAU um, uh, uh, with the uh, executive three. Yeah. Yeah. He always talk about you, man. Just that, that team, and how good it was. That's my guy, man. We talk all, we talk all the time. Yeah, we, we, we had we had a few ballers. We had the we had Kenny Saunders, um the Linda DeBellet, um kept the uh the late Kelvin Scarborough, um Danny Ferry was on that team. Uh Charlie's was Charlie what's Charlie's last name? Charlie Thomas. Charlie Thomas yeah. played with us. And you know we had a few other guys that would come in and out, but we we had some we had some some ballers on that team. Now he talks about that team all the time, man. So uh, you're at, you're at Potomac. Talk about your recruitment out of Potomac. So you, I know you went to American, but but what other offers did you have, and what did that recruitment look like? Well, there, at, at that time, because I was a guy that, that as I said, I I played JV as a as a junior. Um, 
at, at Potomac. Um, and I was, you know, I was told if I ran cross country as a, as a, I was a, as a junior, I'd be on the varsity. So I upheld my end, ran cross country and coach cut me and put me on JV. And he, you know, at that time he told me, Hey man, you're a JV point guard. I gotta just, I gotta put you somewhere. And so, you know, for me as a young kid, you know, I, I, you know, I internalize that as, okay, so I'm not good enough. I, I, I get, I'm not good enough, but you ain't got to tell me, you know, you can kind of give me a few more, you give me a little more encouragement. So I, I went around the corner because I remember I was standing at my homeroom class and I cried in the, in the stairwell and I said, I'm going to show him. And so I played JV and that JV season I played, we were undefeated. And then I ended up getting moved up later on. And then going into the to the spring when we had um, summer league started, we played in Northwestern summer league. We played Northwestern, which was the first one. We played in Urban Coalition in the in the high school division, and we played up at Sidwell Friends. But Northwestern was the first one that started. So the guy who was the starting point guard was was um, James Millings, who was a was the foot quarterback on the football team. And James ended up going and playing in the NFL. James was a a good athlete. And so James was the point guard. And so uh, um, I, James had to go to the prom because of his girlfriend was a senior. And so I was one of the kids that I was sitting on the edge of my seat. You know, I wasn't sitting back, you know, with my, with my face all tied up. I was waiting for my chance. And so that was my chance. And so the rest was history. James came back and the ball was in my hand and almost James kind of looked at me like, Phew. Man, it's about time because look, I'm a football player. This is your thing. So, and and so that's how I ended up, you know. Um, then going into getting into recruiting, I I didn't go to I, I didn't go to five star because uh, I was told I wasn't good enough by my high school coach. I wasn't good enough, and I'd be wasting my money if I went to um, to five star. So my mom basically, you know, had told him, "Hey, look, it's not your money. He's wasting. Just give him the camp form." Got the camp for him late, and by the time I got the camp for him, in I wasn't getting no assistance to help get in, so I ended up going to Red Jenkins camp, which was the McDonald's um, Capital Classic Basketball camp at George Mason, and um, that's where I ended up getting my scholarship um, uh, offer because um, Chris Naki, who was Ed Tap Scott's assistant, saw me playing over there, and he ended up um, calling Tap and said, "Hey, it's a kid over here. I don't know who he is." But you need to come see him. And uh, Tap ended up offering me a scholarship, and he hadn't seen me play a, a varsity game. And then I go into my senior year at Potomac, and then I end up, you know, having a uh, really good senior year and then uh, going on and playing in the Capital Classics that year. And I had already committed to AU. And, it, and actually the only other guy that um, outside of Tap that recruited me at that time was Rick Barnes, who was at George Mason with um, – Joe Harrington. So those were the two guys that had an eye for talent. <laughs> so one thing I was looking at um, when you got to American, you played in three different conferences, it looks like. Uh-huh. At the same school. Right. So, right. and I, you know, that's something that uh, Hampton and North Carolina A&T recently went through going from the right. uh, MEAC to the to the uh, Big South to the uh, CA. Before we get into, like, your individual performances, like, what what was that like? Just going through that different level of play, three different, you know, what, how, how were you able to navigate that? And like, you got better every year. Yeah, um, you know, the, the, the thing that I, I would say that struck that that jumped out at me the most when we went into the CAA, and I'll never forget this. We we played at the Robbins Center, and our home our home arena was Fort Myer Army Base. And I remember walking in the Robinson Center, and we talking, this is 1984, 85. I remember walking in the Robinson Center and looking up and like, oh, my goodness. is This is what, a, a, you know, college arena looks like. So it, from that regard, it, would it, it, it forced me to really, like, look at, like, man, our facilities weren't up to par. And then, like, going, I, I love playing on the road. That's that was one of the things about it because because there were better arenas, and so I, I really loved playing on the road. And I had actually I had thought about transferring, um, but I ended up staying because because of my college coach at Tapscott. You know, because my thing with you know he was loyal to me and offered me a scholarship. hadn't seen me play a varsity game, so I you know to me, you know I, I wanted to return that loyalty. So 
you know, that was the biggest thing that in going from, you know, different conferences, especially like I said, once we got to the CAA, it was like, wow, you know, and then going to, and then, then George Mason stepped their game up and they opened up the Patriot Center, you know? So um, that was one of the biggest things that stuck, that jumped out at me. So, and now see, I mean, you had two years where you averaged over 23 points per game and that's, that's difficult to do in college. Um, you know, what was it, you know, how were you able to improve your game every year to, to, uh, to be able to play at that level so consistently? Well, the the biggest thing that helped me was um, I started playing with guys that were a lot better than me. Like, um, I'll never forget this. Um, Adrian Branch, uh, who's actually going to be coaching with you. Uh, with, in the I Cowboys just talked to him last night. We were talking about okay. you. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Adrian and Kelvin Johnson, who's on uh, the staff at UCF with Johnny Dawkins, um, I, I, they were getting ready to – for the draft, that was I think going into my after my sophomore year, I think it was, or maybe it might have been after my freshman year. And they, I don't, maybe they weren't getting ready for the draft. But anyway, they would come up to AU because we, I, the gym, we had an old gym, and everybody used to come up there and one and would play, and you could kind of get the court and and play. And, and Ed Tapscott, it was it was smart on his part because we didn't have the facilities, but if he knew if he could get guys to come up there and play, that might help get get us some you know, some players. So Adrian and Kelvin were working out um, during the summer, beginning of the summer. And they said, Hey, you, you, you know, come on over. We're going to be over here at 10. So I get over there and they, you know, out there doing these, doing a few shooting drills and running suicides. And we, we playing whole court one-on-one and doing all this stuff. And afterwards they said to me, yo, we're going to be in here tomorrow. You're going to come through in my mind. I was saying, Oh man, I ain't signed up for this. This summertime. But I couldn't, you know, I had to say, yo, I said, yeah, I'll be back. So I came back the next day and I got caught up and caught up and I learned how to work and become a player. And the biggest things that we did, we would do some drills and shoot a little bit. But the biggest thing we did, we play half court one on one. We play whole court one on one. We play two on two. We play three on three and then we play five on five. And so it, it, it helped me. Um, I didn't duck competition and I knew in order, if I wanted to be good, I had to play against guys that were better than me and they forced me to take my game to another level. So after playing against those guys and then it even got to the level was the late Dominic Presley would come up, Presley. Johnny would play, Johnny Dawkins would play, Bill Martin would play. And so I had to learn how to or try to figure out how to slow Adrian up who's six foot eight. And, or try to slow Bill Martin up, trying to you know figure out what his first move would would be if I could force him to the right and maybe you know get a little edge. But then also defensively that helped me. But then also offensively because Johnny was 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 lightning quick, so I had to learn how to get my shot off on him. Bill Martin was six eight and, and, and a freak athlete. Adrian was six eight and long. So by the time I got to the season, because I had put that work in, it didn't matter who the other team put on me. It's just me figuring out, okay, you know, okay, he's going to give me this. I'm going to take this. And so just throughout the summers, I just worked on my game and I lived in the gym. And then, you know, there's no there's no recipe other than getting in the gym and, and definitely playing. And, I, you know, kids today, they do a lot of drill work. But it, to me, it's almost like you you hitting the mitts in, in the speed bag, but you ain't, you, you're not doing any sparring. You know, to see why you need to you need to throw pull that shoulder down and then come back with that left hook. <laughs> nah, man, that's that's you know nothing gets you nothing gets you ready faster than playing against you know competition over your level. So, I mean, you left as a legend at American. So, what what were you from a professional basketball standpoint? What did it look like after you left American? Um, I was drafted by the Sixers um, in the fifth round, um, which I was told I was supposed to go higher. And that didn't happen. So I ended up, I went to camp with Philly, played well, ended up uh, getting cut uh, right before the um, first game of the season. And at that time, they only carried 12 on the active roster. You know, if I was coming out today, then, you know, there's two extra spots. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up coming and going in camp the next year um, with the with the Bullets. And I ended up getting cut there and uh, ended up going overseas and playing in Germany, came back, played in the CBA. And at that time, uh, I played in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And um, I actually played a little quick stint in 
CBA in 88 when I got cut by Philly, but I really don't count that because I don't, I, I think that might have been a couple games. Right. But then when I played in Sioux Falls, I said, hey, you know, if I get called up, um, I do. I said, at that time, you were looking at USA Today in the transaction section, and you could see who got called up. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm not going to look in the transaction section every day to see who got called up and, you know, and like, man, how he get called up? I said, I'm just going to focus on playing. And I said, if I don't, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hang it up because I, you know, I had given it my all and I was good with it. So I, it didn't happen. And so I ended up hanging my sneaks up and, you know, and never looked back. So what, is that when you went to the front office or what, what was your path to where you're at now? Man, Rick, when I got finished playing, I wanted nothing to do with the basketball. <laughs> I'm, I mean, because I, I felt because a couple of people asked me, say, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to coach? And it kind of felt like that was the default because I had that's all I had been doing was playing basketball. So I was looking through an Ebony magazine and I saw an advertisement for uh, the DEA. And I was like, man, law enforcement. So I was still in Sioux Falls at the time. And I ended up staying and started working at the sheriff's department. And I was actually going to be a deputy sheriff in, in Sioux Falls, um, South Dakota, in Minnehaha County. And it was taking too long for me to get through um, uh, before they was going to put me through the academy. So I ended up um, coming back home because the guy I was waiting for to leave was a guy by the name of Phil Niederinghaus. He and I became friends and I used to do ride alongs. I actually worked in the jail and ran the commissary. Um, I was writing tickets out during the daytime, but at nighttime I would run the commissary. So I um, ended up coming back home and applied with um, several departments in the area because I knew I wanted to get in law enforcement. It was a uniform. I felt I had to keep myself in shape and I felt, you know, there was a teamwork structure. So that drew me to law enforcement and I was in, I worked for Arlington County Police Department for five years. And then um, my passion, um, and then I left there after five years and I went in business for myself um, with um, a, a good friend of mine, Donald Grant, who also played at American mm -hmm. and went to Potomac, but Donald was a few years younger than me and he had just finished up getting his master's at AU. So he and I had our own business for five years and, and then it was time to move on and, uh, my passion for basketball came back. And so um, that's how I ended up. Um, uh, I, I got into coaching. I was an assistant coach at the University of Albany. But actually, the very first job I took as an assistant coach, as a volunteer assistant, was with uh, Chuck Drizel. He hired me as a, a volunteer assistant. He was at Marymount College. Um, you know, I got big love for Chuck because he gave me my, my, my first, first coaching job. And it was, it was an unpaid position. And he told me, he said, hey, I can't pay you anything. And I said, Chuck, I said, I'm not chasing the money. I want the money to chase me. And then from there, I ended up going to the University of Albany um, as assistant coach. And then from, from there, I ended up going scouting with the Charlotte Bobcats through my relationship with my college coach um, because he had become the president of the Charlotte Bobcats. And the guy that he hired in the scout that, uh, to oversee the scouting department was the late Kenny Eggman Williamson. And I had... Um, uh, forged a relationship with Eggman and um, everybody called him Eggman and Eggman hired me as a scout. And so I, I've been in the NBA for the past 20 years. And, but that really wasn't my, I, I, I got into basketball actually to be a head coach in division one basketball. I had, I, I didn't even know anything about scouting front office that, that was not even my plan. It was to be a head coach in division one. No, no. I want to talk about something you said. You've been in the NBA for 20 years, right? And the NBA is typically mm -hmm. a year by year business. What advice do you give to people that want, because everybody wants to be a scout. Everybody wants to work in the NBA. Everybody, right. what advice right. do you give to people on how you stay in the league the way you have and um, what event opportunities you take advantage of? Like, what is it that you need to focus on most to have a long career in the NBA front office? Um, I would say for me, the biggest thing, um, as I said before, it just happened organically. I wasn't focused on it. And so once I got in, um, the biggest thing that I learned from, uh, the late great, uh, Eggman was relationships. Relationships are important. And, and this, this, the, 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 the biggest advice I can, I can give to, to young people that, uh, aspire to get in this lane is that don't be in such a hurry. 
to get into it because, you know, I get young guys that they in their twenties and yeah, hey man, I want to scout. I want to scout. And it's like, okay, have you coached before? Have you, have you built on your craft? Okay. Because just because you got the NBA pocket package and you watch games, that's, that's not it. You know, everybody thinks, yo, you know, I can, they can, you know, everybody can, everybody can pick out, um, uh, you know, Kevin Durant, you know, <laughs> so, um, or LeBron James, but it's, it's also, in terms of um, uh, having a network of people that um, also that you can talk to about players and get in different information. But um, the, the biggest thing is that I would say, don't be in a hurry. Uh, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen organically. Cause I've, I've seen guys been trying for 15 years to get in as uh, in the scout position, they banging their head against the wall. And I, I tell people all the time for me, it happened organically. And I, I, I pretty much think, for most people, that's kind of how it happens. If you put yourself like for a young guy, like if my son uh, said he wanted to get into scouting, the first thing I tell him is, man, you need to go coach because coaching is pretty much to me. My, my, my time is playing and coaching has helped me in scouting. And so, you know, when I got into scouting, I was 37 years old and I act and I didn't, I was like, it kind of was like, man, you know, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm scouting for the highest level now. So, and I, and I was humble and I didn't think that I knew everything. You know, I was, I, you know, I would listen to Eggman when he was talking and he in different things about different players that he had seen over the years. And I think if you kind of um, put yourself in that position, cause if say if you and your, you, 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 you 29 right now, say for somebody that wants to get in scouting, they 29 and you've never coached before. Okay. How about go coach somewhere and you could coach for 10 years. What's the rush to get into the NBA? Because right. I think everybody looks at it from they look at like people can look at where I am now, but they don't they like say they don't know my story. <laughs> you know, they don't know where I started from, you know, and I think also being humble enough to take right. like just take a, a volunteer position at a school somewhere. If that if that's what you need to do to get started, because you got to start somewhere, you know, you're just not going because, I you know, I never. I didn't think I was jumping in, you know, I didn't think I was jumping straight into a uh, division one basketball. I started, you know, and, 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 and then I put myself in position to, you know, finally get a division one job. And it, it happened in a, in a, a probably in a quicker time frame because I, I had I, the way I, the way I went about it. You know? No, that's great stuff, man. I'm, 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 I think, I think that clip is going to be played a lot because that, that's important. <laughs> I got one last question for you, right? So this is the, the, you know, caught off guard question that we I do everybody. So you graduated in 1983, right? Mm -hmm. Class of 1983. Who were the top three guys in that class that you wanted to match up with, that you just had the most respect for and you wanted to see on the court? 1983, D.C. area, who did you want to see? Now what happens with this question is people don't focus on who you say. They focus on who you don't say, Right. <laughs> I need three names in 1983 of players that you just wanted to get at. You you know, you talked about being on JV in 11th grade. That was your mm -hmm. turn. Who are the three guys you had your eyes out for? Oh, man. Well, I would probably say being at Potomac, because DeMatha was always the, was the Mount Rushmore. So um, that, that, um, Class in '83 um, at at Dematha because actually we played them. Matter of fact, we played them in Northwestern Summer League and we, we ended up beating them. So I would have loved to have played them during the regular season. Um, but I would say, like individually, as the as the year went on and I saw different guys. Um, be, oh, because I because I, I, when we played down at the um, Urban Coalition Summer League, I, I, I would I would say the guys that. Um, when when I like I'll never forget when we played uh Eastern down there and Scarborough was driving down the lane and dunking like he was shot off of a trampoline. I was like, wow. So the Scarborough's um, one. Scarborough. Um I played and we played Spingarn up at, at um up at uh um uh Sitwell. And so I would have to go with uh, Clarence, Clarence Green, Booty, my uh, guy, Booty, one of my favorites, because um, he was in class eight. And then, you know, I had read about Lyndon 
when at at Cadoza. And so, you know, Lyndon had scored 50 some points. Me and Lyndon used to battle during the summers. So, you know, those guys, and then then also nope. uh, Tommy Allen. can't do it. He don't count. Tommy he Allen. don't count, though, because I huh? said three, so he don't count. I was going to ask you about him. I was going to ask you. I was just talking to Rodney Rice the other day. I was going to ask you about him. I, was, I had my guys, I was, but, he, we'll see. but see, but see, but see, Rodney, I Rodney and I are from the same neighborhood, so I always play, I played against Rodney, you know. So I, you know, I already knew Rodney, but see, all those guys that I named, that was like during the summer, as I was starting to get better, I saw those guys, and I was like, wow, you know, and and they were like, you know, cause Scarborough, Scarborough could jump. Bootney could jump. And then when I saw the Bella when we was in the Capital Classes and the Bella could jump, you know, my jumping increased over the years. See, I would call those guys, they were like elite level athletes. I was an athlete. My athleticism increased. But like, you know, Bootney and Scarborough could probably, you know, dunk without even, you know, warming up. You know, I could, I, I, I never dunked as a senior in high school. <laughs> uh, but I do, I got to ask you one more question because this is, this is fair and this is for the, for people to understand. Give me some guys, some underrated guys that end up playing the NBA that you scouted early on that people might, might not have thought were, you know, going to be great or all-star level, whatever. Who are three guys you saw, not three or whoever, who who guys you saw early on that let you know, you know what, I, I, I'm good at what I do because I saw it in that guy before everybody else did. Um, You know, when I was, when I worked with the, with the Thunder, you know, Russell Westbrook is one. Oh, wow. You know. People, people looked at us, you know, when we made that draft, like he was, like we were crazy. But because um, the one thing about Russell, Russell wasn't a McDonald's guy, you know. Russell was not a McDonald's guy, but Russell had a had a big chip on his shoulder. So I, I, I'd say Russell. And then, kind of more recently, um, I watched this kid at a kid at TCU, and each year I watched him get better. First year I watched him, and he was he was a he was really just more athletic. And didn't shoot, wasn't shooting a whole bunch of threes. But then each year he got better. He got better shooting the ball, and his shooting percentages were always like his senior years in the forties. The kid Desmond Bain mm. at, at Memphis, um, you know, and I, a lot of people felt because he had short arms. But I mean, he can release the ball and it goes in. So um, just kind of like you know, uh, off the top, you know, those like two guys. That's good stuff, man. I appreciate having you, man. It's been a great conversation. I think I think people get a lot out of this. Um, so I appreciate your time, man. We have to do this again sometime. Yes, sir. I, I, and like I said, man, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, and I, I appreciate the footage, too, from the 83. Oh, yeah, man. yeah, man. That, that was, when I saw it, I sent it to you, Rodney, a couple other guys. I feel like y'all y'all deserve to have it, man, because you guys made it made it happen for us, man. So. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm going to also add, like, when when we had that Capital Classic practice, today kid the difference with today is kids see each other all the time. They play against like I had heard about Muggsy, Muggsy, but knew, didn't know who you know didn't know who Muggsy was. And the very first time I played against Muggsy, that was that was an education in itself trying to handle the ball to him. You had to make sure you knew what Muggs was at all times. People talk <laughs> about that man when Muggsy Bowes like, I mean I remember Chris Whitney telling me a story about how. They were having a. He was in San Antonio at the time as a rookie, and Chris Childs was in camp. And Muggsy plucked Chris like I mean, cru- pluck like, a, and it just it almost got in, in him out the league. Like it, it, Muggsy would expose guards. Oh, ain't no know. He, I, I, I would say Muggsy was the equivalent of like Dion on. on he was like a shutdown, a shutdown corner. Because if Muggs was guarding, if you were smart, you would go ahead and advance it, and then get it in the front court, and then go from there. But if you, if you, and as soon as you got the rebound, you had to find him. You had to locate him immediately. Hey, Kurt Smith said that to me. He, when he played against him in the Herbo, he said, I wasn't going to wrestle with Muggsy. He said, I'm going to get the ball to somebody else and I'm going to go put him on a block and he got to deal with me there. I'm not going to deal with him when he has an advantage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Well, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate the audience. Um, Definitely follow the Alumni Basketball League, um, ablballing.com. Also, the podcast will be on Apple Podcasts as well as YouTube. And my brother, Ethan Inspire Films, for producing. We are out. Thank you, everybody.